So the opening verses of the Dhammapada say that all dharmas, all phenomena, are preceded by the mind. The mind is chief, mind-made, are they? In other words, everything depends on our mind. If we are not conscious, then it was as if nothing exists. So therefore, in Buddhism, the primary, the primary quest is to know our own mind. Because where do we live? You think you live in Singapore. Well, yeah, on one level, you will really live in Singapore. And then we think we live in our houses, our apartments, our rooms. Yes, sometimes we live in our homes. So we think we live in our body. But during sleep, we even leave our body. But where can we never leave? What do we take with us everywhere? We take our mind. If we are conscious, then we are here. But although we may take care, great care, of our homes, our rooms, our apartments, we take great care of our bodies, what we eat, medical care, exercise. But the real place that we live and we can never leave behind, even in dreams, is our own mind. And yet, how much attention do we give to cleansing and exercising and making beautiful the one place where we really live, which is our own mind. Now, first of all, let me clarify. In Buddhism, when we talk about mind, in uh, Sanskrit, that is uh, chitta. In uh, Chinese, it's sin. Sin, yes? Yes. So it means not just the intellect, it doesn't just mean the brain, which is like the computer. It, it means the heart-mind, which is a much deeper level of our essential consciousness, our essential awareness, than merely the mechanism of uh, our conceptual thinking mind, which is located in the brain. So when we talk about mind, we're talking about the heart-mind much deeper than just our intellectual thinking. There are many levels of consciousness beyond the surface consciousness of our thinking. If we think of the mind like an ocean, then we could say that our ordinary conceptual thinking mind, which is where we are normally living, is the waves on the surface of the mind, on the surface of the ocean, with the undercurrents of our emotions. But the depths of that ocean, the depths of our consciousness, normally we do not know anything about because we're living on the surface, on the waves. So the Buddha 2,500 years ago said that the average mind is a monkey mind. It doesn't mean those monkeys living in zoos. Now you're in Asia, so you know what monkeys are like. In India, we have monkeys everywhere. They're a real pain. And an ordinary monkey is not that kind of bored, docile thing that one visits in zoos. An ordinary monkey in the wild is, is very active, always jumping from branch to branch, always picking the first fruit, one bite, throws it down, next fruit. 
Most monkeys spend their time jumping around, looking for food, um, looking if, you know, for the males at least, looking for sex, and fighting each other. Occasionally they groom each other nicely, but mostly they're very restless. They're always agitated and they are never at peace. And so the Buddha said, the average mind is like a monkey. That was then, over 2,000 years ago. What he would say now, I don't know. But he also did say that the average mind is like a drunken elephant. And drunken elephants are very, very destructive and out of control. And so this is where we live. All that, all that action isn't just on the television. That action is going on in our own minds. That's where we are. And this is why we have to, if we want any genuine happiness and any genuine peace, we have to tame this wild monkey mind. So fortunately, one thing can be said for the Buddha Dharma is that the Buddha didn't just say, be peaceful, be kind, be patient. He also gave methods, he gave techniques for learning how to be more calm, how to be more patient, how to be more kind and loving. And, and so this is very, very useful for any of us, just to learn how to be good human beings. So we have this mind, this mind which is like a mad, drunken little monkey, jumping and screaming and running all over the place. What to do? Because we cannot leave the monkey behind. The monkey is with us wherever we go, wherever we travel. So, what to do? Well, first thing is to tame the monkey. We have to tame the monkey, then train the monkey. By training the monkey, we get a transformed monkey and eventually we can transcend the monkey, right? So we have the four T's. We tame, we train, we transform, and eventually we transcend, okay? But we cannot transcend if we haven't even started on step one, which is to tame. So how to tame the monkey? Traditionally, people in Buddhist countries in Asia, they regard any serious Dharma practice as the, um, the particular duty for monks, sometimes nuns, but mostly monks. And the lay people's duty is simply to support the monks who are the professionals doing the job. And so it, for 2,000 years, more than 2,000, two and a half thousand years, this was how it was in all Buddhist countries, that the main practitioners would be the monastics and the lay people's main duty was to support the monastics in doing their professional Dharma work. But in the last 50 years maybe, Things have changed a lot in the Buddhist world, not only in the West, but also in um, advanced uh, Asian countries such as Singapore, where the majority now of very sincere Dharma practitioners are lay people. Look at you. We have three monastics here. 
a lama who is a wonderful lama, but he doesn't speak any English, so he's gone to sleep. But he's here to support. He's a, a lovely, lovely lama. And two um, eminent Mahayana nuns. That's it. The rest of this audience are lay people. This is the first time in Buddhist history that this has happened. That the main people wanting to know how to practice are actually the laity. Now this has come about partly because now you are all highly educated. Obviously you are English speaking, otherwise you would not be here. But also, you are all very educated. Many of you are professional people. You have families. You have social commitments. You have your own professions, which demand a lot of time and energy. And yet, you have enough interest in spiritual matters to take out this Saturday afternoon to come to listen to me, which is amazing. So therefore, the question then is, how can we use our daily life without renouncing family, profession, and so forth, how can we transform our everyday life into a dharma practice? Because this is very important. Even the most dedicated do not have much time for formal practice or for formal retreats. Traditionally, you might think when you go to temples, when we sit reading sutras, when we are in the retreat situation, then that is dharma practice. And the rest of our day with the family, at work, in our social life, that is worldly activity. And so we have this much dharma, this much worldly activity. And then we wonder why nothing changes. So clearly this is not so helpful. What we need are certain ways of taking our ordinary daily life, our family, our friends, our colleagues, our work, and so forth, and those very situations, transforming them into our practice. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So number one, taming monkey mind. I do think it is very helpful to have a daily formal practice. If possible, early in the morning when we get up, then we can put aside a small amount of time for just dedicating ourselves to the practice that if whatever meditations any of you have learned, do it. Different people have different meditations, but all of them are valid. Do them. Even only 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, however long we can give for it, that is our time just to go inward. And 
to, at the same time, commit ourselves to using this day to be of benefit to ourselves and to others. Today, I will use my day for the benefit of others. Set the, your, your GPS, right, your inner GPS, benefiting others. Then whatever happens, we can remember that. This is what we are trying to do. Others doesn't just mean people out there. You know, sometimes in Buddhism, we talk a lot about all sentient beings, right? All those little SBs out there. All sentient beings, right? Well, thinking may all sentient beings be happy is very good. It's very comfortable. But, you know, what about the sentient being, you know, right next to you? Your family? Your colleagues? Yourself? All sentient beings means all. And we shouldn't just think of them out there somewhere on the horizon. But they're the people around us, the people we meet, the people we know best our partners, our spouse, our children, our parents, our neighbors, the people we work with. These are all sentient beings, and all sentient beings wish for happiness. Right? Keep that in mind. So we get up in the morning, and if possible, we sit and we try to bring to our mind into our body and whatever is your particular practice as i say at that time that is the time to do it when the mind is still fairly fresh before the rest of the day takes over just to be with ourselves and to sit with our practice. Even if it's very short, it's better to do a short practice constantly than just once a week to do just one long practice and the rest of the week to forget it. You know, so even if we can only give it 10 minutes, 10 minutes every day is more precious than two hours on Sunday. Do you understand? It's the continuity which builds up. So we sit and we practice whatever is our particular technique of meditation, and we commit ourselves to using this day for the benefit of others and that we will try our best to bring kindness into our interrelationship with others. All genuine meditation is based on cultivating a quality of mind which is called awareness. It also can be called mindfulness, attention, consciousness. It's that ability of the mind, the first step, first step, is the ability of the mind to observe, to observe without comment. This is a very, very important quality in Buddhism. The ability to be aware, to know, without having to evaluate or judge, just knowing. And because this is such an important quality, 
for us to learn how to cultivate, how to develop. This is the way to tame the monkey and then to train it. In Buddhism, we usually start in all Buddhist schools with the breath. Now, many, many of you here, I'm sure, know uh, the meditation on the breath as it is taught in various Buddhist schools. But the, the point, is, the reason why the breath is useful, first of all, is because we are always breathing. And normally, when we are breathing, we are not aware that we are breathing. We, it's one of those automatic functions of the body which we don't give any thought to, we just breathe. But we can know the breath if we want to. So if I ask you all to stop breathing, we can all hold our breath. Right? We can't stop the heart beating. We can't stop the liver functions or the stomach from digesting food. But we can stop our breath for a limited amount of time if asked to do so. So there is a connection between our consciousness and the breathing. At the same time, we cannot breathe in the past or in the future. We only breathe now. So if our awareness knows the breath as it goes in and it goes out, then at that moment, we are present. Now, it's very hard for our egoic mind, the mind ruled by this small self, to stay present. If we get to understand our mind, we recognize how much our mind is caught up in the past, in memories, comparisons, and just thinking back to what's happened in, before, 50 years before, 20 years before, yesterday, five minutes ago. All caught up in the future with our plans, our fantasies, our dreams, our ideas of what will happen next, our fears of what will happen next. But the one place that the mind has a really hard time to stay is now. To stay in the present is very hard for the mind. We don't recognize how difficult it is to actually be present with what is happening right here, right now, without commenting, without discussing it in our heads. So, therefore, this very simple meditation on the breath is a very skillful way to bring the mind into the present and at the same time to develop this important quality of awareness. Awareness means knowing. Normally, we don't know what's going on because we are too busy talking to ourselves. We are chattering away to ourselves the whole time, and we miss what is actually happening. For example, we are all sitting here, but how many of us are aware that we are sitting, experiencing, the feel of sitting, unless we are uncomfortable. Normally, once we are sitting, then our mind's gone off in all directions, but it's not where we are. So it's very important to develop the ability to be present, to be centered, So we learn how to observe, 
how to witness. And first, we observe the breath. So, we are just going to sit for five minutes and do this. It's very simple. The most important thing is that you keep your feet on the ground if you can. If your feet are too small, then never mind. If you're at home, then you can put a cushion under your feet. And keep the back straight, but not tense. The hands can either be uh, here or on our knees, resting gently. Just keep the neck feeling slightly down, but not feeling relaxed. The most important thing, two important things. First, to be focused and to be relaxed. Don't make the mind tight. Hmm? Keep the mind there. Isn't it wonderful? You have nothing to do except sit, breathe, and know that one is breathing. That's it. Nothing. Right? So please just breathe normally. The attention should especially be on the out breath and then a slight pause and then the in breath just naturally coming in and then again the out breath just knowing it that's all and if after a short time you get bored and the mind gets carried away with thinking again just notice bring it back to the breath what we are trying to do the breath is not the really important thing so maybe only 30% of our attention is to the breath, and the majority of the attention is to the fact of being aware. Be aware of being aware. Do you understand? Because this is a practice in learning how to develop this quality of being mindful, of being conscious and aware. So that is what we are interested in. It's the awareness rather than just the breath. The breath is like a, a support for our awareness. Okay? So this is a very important, it's a very simple, simple practice, but it is the very first step in learning how to tame our monkey mind. First step to taming the monkey mind is to allow the mind to become more quiet, more calm, and to watch the monkey by looking at this point at the breath as it goes in and especially as it goes out. Any sounds we hear, just ignore them, they're just sounds. So, we will just sit for five minutes and observe the breath. It comes in, it goes out. It comes in and it goes out. And we know it. That's all there is to do.
So this basic awareness of the breath is very fundamental and it's very useful. I mean, even during our day, if we get tired, if we get agitated, if we get a bit overwhelmed, then just to bring the attention back to breathing in, breathing out, even for one or two minutes, can really, really help to diffuse the situation and get the mind back into a state of open, spacious relaxation and attention. It can be very useful. Also, you know, if, we are, if we're traveling in a train or a plane, instead of just getting absorbed in all these, you know, things that people get themselves absorbed into when they're sitting on planes, we can sit and do some practice. We can sit breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, in traffic jams. Instead of getting all upset and agitated every time we hit a red light or, you know, um, you know too much traffic, oh, what a good opportunity to practice. Sit there, breathing in, breathing out. In Delhi, in New Delhi in India, they used to have on the uh, stoplights, on the red stoplights, they would have white letters saying, relax. So that's something for Singapore, you know? Those red lights, <sighs> breathing in, breathing out. This is very useful. In Thich Nhat Hanh's Sangha, Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Vietnamese master, they have what they call a mindfulness bell. And so throughout the day when people are working or whatever they're doing from time to time, everyone stops what they're doing and just focuses on the breath, breathing in, breathing out. Just for a minute, back to the present, back to here. Now, when we have become really able to maintain our focus, our attention, our awareness, the awareness is clear. Watching the breath going in, going out, we can do that without getting distracted. Maybe 21 breaths without being distracted. We, we are present watching the breath as it comes in and it goes out. When we feel a sense of really being aware, then we can turn that awareness, that attention back onto the mind itself. This is a very <clears throat> important step in our spiritual lives because normally we are so identified with our thoughts and feelings that we think, I am my thoughts and feelings. We believe our thoughts and feelings. People believe what they believe. People will kill for what they believe. They will die for what they believe. Our thoughts, we swim in an ocean of thought. And like a fish, we don't recognize the medium in which we're swimming. So the ability to step back and observe our thoughts and feelings just as thoughts and feelings and not me and mine is a big step forward. But we cannot do that until we have cultivated the ability to be aware. And we cultivate the ability to be aware by observing the breath.
Do you understand? It's, it goes up step by step. We can't skip steps. But if we consider the, the thoughts and feelings now as like a river endlessly flowing by, normally we are caught up in the river and we're, we're swept along by the river, completely engulfed in the river. Our thoughts, our feelings, our hopes, our fears, our joys, our sorrows. We are absolutely, totally immersed in our mental world. And now we are going to step out of the river and sit on the bank of the river and watch the river go by. And we can do this. We can do this. And what will happen is that, first of all, we will understand we are not our monkey mind. Because if we were the monkey, we would not be able to observe the monkey. The fact that we can observe the monkey means we are not the monkey. Right? Do you understand? So the fact that we can step out and observe the mind, this mind stream, or the thoughts, means that we are not that mind stream, that there are further levels of consciousness beyond the normal conceptual mental stream. Otherwise, we could not witness. Now, when we can witness, what also happens is that we feel a, a space between the witnessing awareness, the mindfulness which knows, and what it is knowing, which at this point is, is the mental stream. So between the two, there is a space. Thoughts arise from that space and disappear into that space. Normally, because we are so immersed in our thinking, we don't even know there's space there. It's, it's like if you're in, in the clouds, then if we're surrounded by clouds, we don't even recognize that there is other parts of the sky which is not cloud. So here we're stepping out and we're observing the clouds, but we're not immersed in the clouds. Are you following? This is also very, very, very useful. This is not ultimate truth, but it's very, very useful to witness. And even during the day, as much as possible, we should try to observe the mind. When I, I first began, um, I, I lived with these yogis and they told me that every hour I should look at the mind three times. The books say to observe the mind at all times, but you can't do that at all times if you can't even do it once. So we start with a very simple, three times every hour to make the commitment to stop for a second and look back. What is the mind doing at this time? Because normally we are so carried away by our mind that we're not even aware of what we're thinking or what we're feeling. So now we're stepping out and we're looking and seeing what state is the mind in at this time? Are we happy? Are we peaceful? 
Are we concentrated? Are we anxious? Are we annoyed? Are we depressed? What's our mind doing at this moment? And then if the mind is in a positive state, then that's good. And we can, you know, carry on. If the mind is in a negative state, then we are aware of that and we apply the antidote. We will deal with antidotes in a minute. So it's like if we have a sickness, you know, if, if, the, if the limb is healthy, then we leave it alone. But if there's some problem, then we have to find a remedy to help that problem, to cure it, right? But if we're not even aware of it, if we're not conscious of it, then it's just going to degenerate more and more and more until it becomes incurable. So our mind is like that. The negative emotions the Buddha called poisons. They poison our mind and make it sick. So we have to be aware. Is our mind sick? And if it is, what poison is it's doing this? And then how to find the remedy, how to find the antidote to that poison? in order to make the mind healthy again. So, during our formal meditation time, we should learn how to make the mind a little more calm and especially more conscious, more aware, more present. Then use that attention to look and observe the mind itself and to recognize that we can be centered within ourselves without needing to always be caught up in the turbulence of the mind. As we become more skilled in being aware, then the mind of itself begins to calm down and get itself more in order, because it's being watched. It's like children. If they're left to themselves, they go wild. But if they're what, being watched, then they're more careful. And likewise, with our mind, if we're observing the mind, then the mind begins to <clears throat> you know, get itself a bit more into order. And, and not start messing around so much, right? You watch and you'll see. The mind does that. If we're thinking really stupid thoughts and we become aware that we're thinking these stupid thoughts, then we're not thinking those stupid thoughts anymore because we're aware. Much of what we do with our mind during the day is just a waste of time and causes a lot of fatigue and stress because we don't know how to use the mind skillfully. Our mind is out of control. The mind, our ordinary conceptual thinking mind, is a brilliant tool, but when it thinks it's the master, then it is a, a very tyrannical master. It's a good servant, hopeless master, because it is ignorant. So we have to learn how to be the masters of our own mind, in control of our own mind, knowing our own mind. It's very important. And this is why also those of you who have the time and the opportunity to undertake more extended um, retreats, meditation retreats, are very encouraged to do so. Because this, with guidance, with good guidance, 
um, an extended period of time to really get to work on the mind, understand the mind, and learn how to really um, make the mind more pliable, more workable, more serviceable, so that we, we can use the mind usefully instead of being driven here and there by the mind, which is out of control like the monkey. This is what meditation retreats are for. They're to help us to really become the masters of our own mind and to understand our mind. Because, as I say, mostly we live within our mind, but we don't even know what the mind is. We never look. What is the thought? I think this, in my opinion, that. But what is a thought? Where does it come from? Where does it go to? Who is thinking? And if we say, well, I am thinking, okay, who am I? Look, find this I. Okay, so first step is how important it is to become the owners of our own mind instead of the slaves of our mind. It's very, very important. Then, along with that, the heart. Because it is very important to open our heart. All of us sitting here would rather feel okay rather than not okay. All of us would rather feel happy rather than miserable. Nobody really wants to be depressed. Nobody wants to be anxious. Nobody wants to be angry and moody and just stressed out. Who chooses that? How many people get up in the morning and think, I think today, I don't know, I think today I will feel nice and grumpy and angry and irritated and stressed out and depressed and generally hating the world. That sounds like a good day. And yet that's how many people are living. Despairing, depressed. Suicide rates are soaring. So many people on all these, you know, these kind of um, opioids for, for, you know, making you feel better. Maybe not so much in Singapore, but in so much of the world nowadays, people are popping pills the whole time just to get through the day. And yet, outwardly, their day looks wonderful. They're not living in the slums of Calcutta. They outwardly have everything. All of you, outwardly, have so much. I live in India. So many millions of people living on the streets or in unbelievable slums. Compared with that, all of you are living in the God realm, in the Devalok. Hmm? I mean, you come to Singapore after being in Delhi. I mean, it's a, it's a God realm. So clean, relatively crime-free, people are well-dressed, they all have so much to eat, they all have so much everything. So why are you not all blissed out? Why is youth so much in despair, stress? 
The reason is what we were saying at the beginning, that we do not ultimately live in our homes or even in our bodies. We live in our minds. And unless our minds are free, then we are all enslaved. So this is the problem. Outward situation really impacts very little on our own internal feeling of well-being or not. I mean, it's there. Everybody needs to have some, you know, somewhere to live, enough food, education for the children, and so forth. Some basic level of security for most people is essential. But beyond that, what? Why are people not, the more they get, not happier? Because they're not. They're really not. So, so we are first taming the mind by learning how to bring the awareness to the forefront of the mind. How to be aware, because we are all aware. You are hearing me. You are seeing me. So we are aware, right? It's not like you have to make some magic thing we don't have before. We all have awareness. Otherwise, you've been conscious. We're all conscious. The problem is that we are not aware of being aware. And so therefore that awareness gets swept along by all our conceptual thinking mind and we are not centered. We get lost. We get lost in all our thoughts of the past or the future and we don't know how to stay present and be where we are right now. So this is why these practices are for not just for when we're sitting nicely, but for every day, all the time, as much as possible, to bring our mind back into the present moment, which is in actual fact all we have. So, we've been doing our practice, then we get up, open the door, and the rest of the day begins. So for many of you, that means dealing with your family, breakfast, dealing with your partners, your children, your parents, whoever is around you. In that moment, how to make them happy? As I said, all of us wish for happiness. We don't wish to be irritable and depressed, but we are irritable and depressed. So the important thing is to think how to use our day to try to make others just a bit more happy. Recognizing that all beings wish for happiness. Everybody wishes for happiness, not just human beings, animals, birds, fish, insects. All beings want happiness. They want to feel okay. They don't want to suffer. So just as I would rather be happy than miserable, everybody else would rather be happy than miserable. The Buddha started by teaching uh, this um, meditation, which many of you will know, which is the meditation on metta, or metri, um, which basically is the connotation of a friend. So a good friend is someone who makes us feel better and likes us, right? That's the idea is that we become friendly, kind. 
wishing well. And the Buddha said, start with yourself. Wish yourself well. Wish yourself to be happy. Think, how nice it would be if I felt good. Wouldn't that be nice? Just that. We'd rather feel cheerful and nice than feel miserable. Wish ourselves that. How nice if I felt nice. May I feel nice. And make friends. Because wherever we go, we take ourselves with us. So we might as well take a good friend. Why take an enemy? And then from that, we send the good feelings to people that we love, our family, our good friends. And then to people we're indifferent towards, people we see every day but don't think one way or the other if they would want to be happy, knowing they would want to be happy. And then to people we have problems with, maybe at work or our neighbors or politicians or whoever, people that we find difficult that we blame, I would be okay if it wasn't for so-and-so. Wish them happy. May they be well and happy. May they be free from suffering. Why not? And then the whole world, and all the beings in the world, may they all be happy. You're sitting in a bus. Then fill that bus full of light Imagining it going into all the beings in that bus, including the driver, or a plane, or a train, or a traffic. Every single being you look at would rather be happy than be sad. Wish them well. Smile. Even the people who are not important to you, me, they're important to themselves. The Buddha said that to each one, his own self is most precious. So who is to say who is high, who is low? We're all, each one of us, wishing that we, each one of us, should feel well and happy. So wish that for everybody. If we did that during the day, that would also lighten. You're sitting in your office surrounded by all these other people in the office. Just send out light and wish them all well and happy. And be kind. The Buddha also taught the six paramita, the six especially um, exalted qualities of which the first is generosity, and then ethics. You know, all Buddhist ethics are based on not harming any being in body, speech, or mind. And patience. Patience meaning when people annoy us, instead of being angry back, we recognize that patience is a very important quality for us to develop. So, therefore, these people who are annoying us, upsetting us, are our opportunity for developing this quality of patience. If everyone is nice to us, we are, can think we're very nice people because everybody's nice. But it's when people are not nice, when people don't say what we want them to say, don't do what we want them to do, that's when we can practice. And instead of getting all upset, we can be more forbearing, we can be more tolerant, and we can be grateful. Oh, you're so horrible. Thank you for being so difficult. Now I can really cultivate this important quality needed in order to fulfill our human potential. The first parameter is generosity, dana. Generosity doesn't just mean giving things. Asian people are very generous. It's one of the main differences in a way. I mean, it's not that 
Western people are not generous, but Asians are beyond generous in a way that Westerners are not. And so this is a very beautiful quality. And, in, and, and I, I respect very, very much that people are so generous, generous with their, their money, with their possessions, with their time. It's a beautiful quality of the heart and the hands. But also we can be generous with our being there for people. Even if we don't have anything to give materially, we can be there for people if they need help. We can listen. If you have a friend who is having problems, then we can be there for them, listening to them, hearing them, giving them our time. This is also a very important quality of generosity, just that we're there for people. And so during the day, as you go through your day, every single person that you meet is the most important person in the world at that moment because they are the person we are with. Do you understand? So therefore they should have our full attention. In the Lojong teachings, it says that we should put all others as superior to ourselves and ourselves as inferior. But this doesn't mean that we have to cultivate an inferiority complex. What it means is that we should recognize that whoever we are with, that person at that moment is the most important person. And we are not important. I mean, some people, when they meet people, they're just thinking, oh, I wonder what he's thinking about me. I wonder if he thinks I'm attractive. I wonder if she, I wonder if she's feeling jealous of how nice I look. And it's all about what are they thinking about me, right? But that's nonsense. Total nonsense. Because first of all, we don't know what the other person is thinking. They're probably not thinking about us at all. Or else they're thinking, oh, I wonder if she's thinking I'm attractive. Oh, I wonder if... Which is nonsense, right? So therefore, the other person is of supreme importance. We are not of importance. So when we meet anyone, our interest is in them, not in ourselves. Do you understand? It's very important. Each other person is most dear to themselves, so we also treat them as most dear. So we go through the whole day with our family, at our workplace, in our social situation, being aware, being present. We, inside, our, I mean, you know, there, there is this inner space, we are there centered in this inner space of attention, of awareness, present, knowing. And within that, in whatever the situation, we try to be helpful, kind, generous, patient, and so forth. We use others as a means to cultivate these qualities of the heart. And when negative feelings arise, we notice them. Oh, we're getting irritated, annoyed. Somebody, you know, goes in front of us in the traffic or, you know, somebody, I know this is, in Singapore, you never do this. But in India, people push in front of you in queues and so forth. And people do say things and do things which make us very upset. And we 
react in our mind by being angry. We notice that. We train our mind to be aware of what is happening inside us. When we know what is happening inside us, we can change it. In this way, we transform. If we are not aware, then by the time we've noticed we're angry, we're way down the road. Very difficult. We've already said bad things and gotten all upset, and they are saying bad things back again, and next thing you know, we're shouting at each other. It's too late. But if we are aware, if we are conscious, then as soon as a feeling of upset, anger arises, we recognize it. And when we recognize it, then we are still in control and we can deal with it. There are many different ways of dealing with our negative emotions. We don't have time to go into it all. But the important thing is first to know it. Like anger, we, we recognize that we're angry as soon as possible. Then we accept that. Yeah, right now I'm angry. Then that already has given a gap in which we then can decide what to do. Shantideva, who was a great um, Indian philosopher of the 8th century, he says that if we cannot deal with anger when it arises by, you know, transforming it or by cultivating patience, then we should be like a block of wood. We should be like a log. In other words, if we cannot transform our anger into mirror-like wisdom or into at least patience, we can at least not react at all. We stay like a, a, a log of wood, and that gives us a chance to get back into, we haven't done any harm. We've not said angry words. We've not, you know, jumped up and down. We just, mm. And that gives us space for us to come back into a state of awareness and deal with the situation more skillfully. Because we are trying to use our daily life skillfully. So everything which happens to us is the opportunity to practice. Walking down the road, walking down a corridor, climbing up and down stairs. Either we are aware or we are not aware. Normally when we are walking, we are walking and the mind is thinking 10,000 different things. But we can also walk and be conscious that we're walking. Not thinking of anything except the act of walking. Anything we do, we can do it either with mindfulness, with awareness, or not. Ordinary things. Mindfulness is not just something we do when we're sitting. The Buddha said we should be mindful when we're standing, sitting, walking, lying down. At all times, we should know what's going on. Be present in our bodies and then with the mind, knowing what, what's going on so that we are at the center instead of being endlessly distracted. Our minds are stressed out, not because we're so efficient, but because we are not efficient. I read an article in The Economist, which is not a Buddhist magazine, 
It's a, a British publication uh, for business and economics, as it says, The Economist. And it was an article ab about neuroscientists and their latest finds uh, dealing with stress. And they said that they have found that people, um, one of the causes, the main causes of stress in the business world is multitasking, trying to do too many things at the same time. And they said the problem is that the, the brain is not wired to multitask. And when it does so, what happens is that it gets very stressed. It is less efficient. It makes mistakes. And it is superficial. It doesn't go down to deeper levels of creativity because it's juggling too many balls in the air at the same time. And so they said that it made much more sense, was much more efficient, and also at the same time, saved on stress levels. They said people get stressed not because they are more efficient, but because it's all become too distracted and the mind can't cope. So they get exhausted, but they haven't done more work. It's just that they're, they're just not focused. And at the end of the article, uh, he was asking, well, this is The Economist, um, what is the solution to this? And he said the solution was to take a course in mindfulness and do a meditation retreat. So, I quote my sources here, right? As many of you know, nowadays, mindfulness, of course, has become a new buzzword in, in both the psychological circles and psychiatric circles, but also in business circles. I have friends who are teaching mindfulness courses to the army, in prisons, and, of course, in big businesses, because people recognize that our minds are going crazy and it doesn't help anybody or anything. Of course, businesses want it so that people can not get so stressed out and don't take so much time off and are more efficient and therefore get more profits for, the, for their company. But, and so then Buddhists get very upset and say, this is not right, this is, you know, this is a misuse of mindfulness. But I think anyway, who cares? If people are learning how to become more aware, more conscious, does it really matter that it doesn't come under, you know, the, the Buddhist flag? It doesn't matter. I mean, we don't have a copyright on, on mindfulness. Mind you, I saw um, a, a, an advertisement, a full-page advertisement in Time magazine for a new book put out by Time magazine called Mindfulness, the New Science of the Mind. America has discovered it, so it's new. Right? But good. Good. People who read Time magazine and buy that book, they will never buy a Buddhist magazine but they will learn how to be mindful. So that's good. So the key is that. The key is the mind. To learn how to be aware. There are deeper levels of awareness than this dualistic observer observed, but even just to get to the point of being able to observe the mind and know what is happening at the time it is happening without comment, 
is already an enormous step forward and can bring very deep inner peace because we recognize that we are not our mind. The mind is very useful. The mind is a brilliant tool, but it is not who we are. But we can only recognize that through practice. And that practice is not just when we are sitting formally, but throughout the day, as much as we can, to remember, to be present, to be aware. Just, just know you're where you are. Feel the body. Look at the mind. Just be here. It doesn't take time. The word for mindfulness in Sanskrit and also in Tibetan is the word to remember. And it's the usual ordinary Tibetan word for remember and also in, in Sanskrit. Because we, the direct enemy is that we forget. We forget to remember. Remember what? Remember who and how and where to be present. Ajahn Brahm, who I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, coined a very nice word to join together the idea of mindfulness and at the same time being kind. He calls it kindfulness. And so all of us should spend our day being kindful, right? Not just mindful and aware, but also recognizing everyone wants happiness. May all beings be happy, and especially the one that I am with. Loving awareness. Say that to yourself. I am loving awareness. Whenever we get frazzled and frustrated and upset, I am loving awareness. So take that to our day. That tames the monkey mind, trains the monkey mind, transforms the monkey mind, ready to transcend altogether the monkey mind. So may you all, each one, be very well and happy. Thank you.